be willing to pay the toll uh, at the time or near the time they were going through that toll gantry uh, with an online portal, they were certainly less likely to pay it many weeks later by mail. And so in states, uh, including New York, uh, you can go online be so before you receive this pay-by-plate invoice. Uh, and it's advertised on giant blue signs surrounding the toll gantry. And it just says something like, you know, when you park, when you're done driving, go to ny.gov slash tolls or something. I don't remember exactly what it is. And you go and you put in your driver's plate, your license plate number. And it says, oh, you owe $4.25. Would you like to pay that by credit card right now? And you say yes. And you pay the toll and they never send anything in the mail and it's taken care of, and the state gets its money, and they avoid all the postage, and uh, everybody's happy. And um, this is a low-cost thing, right? This is, you gotta design a, an internet payment system. Geez, if, if we haven't figured this out in this state by 2022, we're in trouble. Uh, and you have to put up a bunch of big blue signs near toll gantries, uh, both, both on the pike and of course, uh, near bridges and tunnels that have tolls, but there's not that many of them. And my instinct, I, I can't I can't prove this to you, but my instinct is the amount of incremental tolls collected by people who are willing to pay the tolls then, but maybe don't get around to mailing them in later from their homes out of state, more than pays for the cost of implementing the program. And it treats our residents and our guests more fairly. It allows them to pay their toll it allows them to pay their toll under circumstances where the alternative is worse for them or for uh, their friend or, or loved one from whom they're borrowing a car. The state gets its money sooner. They can expense it on their business expenses if, if that's the nature of the toll. Um, everyone's better off. And this is a problem, by the way, that we invented for ourselves several years ago when we took away the ability to pay the toll at the toll in cash. Right Prior to that point, you could just pay in cash. It wasn't ideal for everyone, but it worked for some people. We took that choice away and we haven't replaced it with anything else. And this presents an opportunity to fix um, that efficiency we sought in going to all electronic tolling. Let's, we're in the age of the internet. Let's use it. I think Mass DOT probably has the authority to do this all on their own, but sometimes um, they need a nudge from our friends in the legislature uh, and that starts with this body right here. And so I'm hopeful uh, that you will uh, report H3625 out favorably to begin the process of allowing folks who don't have an easy pass to actually pay their tolls in a timely way um, in compliance with the law. Happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm sorry, Chair, I'm not able to hear you. My bad. Uh, thank you, Rep. Uh, thank you for taking the time to share that with us on that last uh, point. I suspect you're right that uh, MassDOT already has the authority to implement this kind of payment system. Uh, uh, but uh, sometimes, even with authority, they don't exercise it. So we'll see what we can do. I know you and I have discussed this bill uh, previously uh, face to face. Uh, uh, Chair, sure, Add, if I could just add quickly, um, two years ago, I had a bill that, that worked differently, uh, and it would have actually required rental car companies to provide the- I, I, I remember, and, oh. I, and I apologize for, for cutting you Well, off, you suggested there might be a better way, and I just wanted to well, thank you for I, that suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry to be rude. I, I just want to uh, there, get to some other witnesses and, so, and, and not talk, if I can, about bills from last session. So- if you don't mind, uh, are there any questions from members of the committee on uh, the matter now now in front of us? Uh, Senator Rush, I see with his hand up, if you meant it. Uh, the chair yes, will recognize you. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me, yes. Chairman Strauss? Yes, uh, I Representative, can. Representative, uh, great bill and great testimony. I appreciate it. I'm just curious um, because uh, many constituents, and I've dealt with it myself, I mean, easy pass is a disaster as it is, it's a real mess. And then if you have an issue, trying to actually get somebody to help you is impossible uh, to deal with. So uh, the frustration level is high. Have you received 
Um, any feedback on your proposal from MassDOT or the folks at Easy Pass? Because to me, it just seems like a, 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 an extremely uh, sensible way to deal with Easy Pass issues that I think uh, probably everyone on this call and all of our constituents deal with on a regular basis. And again, trying to get these situations uh, straightened out is ne nearly next to impossible. Uh, as, as you mentioned, it's hard to get in touch with our friends at Easy Pass. I have not successfully reached out to them. They have not uh, reached out to me. Obviously, the bill was filed a year ago, um, and we have not coordinated on this as of yet. I appreciate it. Great job. Thank you. Uh, great question. Great question, Senator. And um, maybe even just as a result of today's hearing, uh, we could get some movement within the administration and their, their contracted parties. Uh, thank you again, Rep. Fatolo, for taking the time on this. Really appreciate it. Uh, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, continuing, uh, for those who've signed up, I, I think I've got three more legislators. Thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, the next that I saw in order of them uh, uh, signing up and being here, uh, Rep. Socolo, recognize you now. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to be here, and I appreciate the members of the committee and the time to testify. Um, I am here to testify on H3427 and Senate 2260, which was filed by uh, former Senator Boncore, an act relative to a resilient transportation system. On this bill, I collaborated with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and I know they will testify later about the particulars of the bill. But it's a fairly simple, straightforward um, issue, and I think actually vitally important. Uh, some may know that the Global Warming Solutions Act requires our executive branches to do vulnerability assessments. But what it doesn't require is that these departments actually do cost estimations and prioritizations. And with a system as large as the MBTA and the MassDOT capital system, um, it's really... It, absolutely necessary that we have a detailed cost estimate to understand um, the potential for uh, climate damage that could happen to our system. We all remember when Hurricane Sandy halted the whole city of New York with the flooding that happened in their subway system. We know that fires and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes are increasingly uh, frequent due to climate change, and we are not in a position to actually understand the cost it's going to take to make our system climate resilient. Um, the Mass Tra um, Taxpayers Association um, estimate is that it's over a billion dollars just for state of good repair for transit maintenance and safety, but, but that is without any consideration for the cost to actually make our system climate ready. So the bill just asks that we do this planning and, and the study. Um, as I mentioned, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, which serves, for many of you may know this as the vice chair of the Boston MPO, which does all of the long range planning for um, the inner core of the state and they are in a position to know the lack of um, planning that's necessary that has not yet been done um, by um, Mass DOT and the MBTA. So that's the, the gist of this bill. Um, appreciate any consideration that you can give to hopefully report it out favorably and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Rep. And, and I know that um, your interest in this is informed by the extensive experience you you brought to the legislature when you first came from at the municipal and, and the regional level, and, and particularly with the planning council. So uh, we'll look very uh, seriously at that and, and see if we can you know, get some of these planning uh, efforts underway. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Rep. Nice to see you. And thank, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, Take care. Uh, I have two more legislators, and uh, again, I thank them for their patience also. I see Rep. Owens is here, and then I'll be calling on Senator Comerford. Uh, thank you both for waiting. And uh, Rep. Owens, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Strauss. Thanks, uh, Vice Chair Keenan, members of the committee. Thanks for taking me out of turn. Uh, great to see everybody. I'm just going to speak very briefly on H3560, which is an act to protect motorists from uh, excessive easy pass fees and fines. It's also filed as S3560, 
2349 by Senator Lewis. Uh, and just right off the bat, the bill does not change any fees or fines. It simply, very simply, requires MassDOT to make a reasonable effort to notify EasyPass account holders when they accrue more than $100 in outstanding fees and fines. And what that does, it'll aim to prevent individuals from receiving these large fines out of the blue and just gives them a chance to pay their bills before they get too large uh, to address. Uh, now that we've moved away from the uh, the use of toll booths and from the yellow lights that uh, that warn motorists if they need to pay their account, it's even more likely uh, that account holders are going to be caught off guard with substantial fees and fines. And this could result from a mistake as simply as forgetting to update an address on file. So the bills all go to an old address and you never actually see them. Uh, since the advent of electronic tolling, uh, mass stop that was an increase of English learners during the pandemic year initially in 2021. All right, so shifting gears from data, we wanted to update you on our tiered focus monitoring. In December 2020, Lynn was cited for partial implementation on two compliance indicators. First, program structure with a focus on elementary ESL service, as well as the consistent decline of English learners making adequate progress in our classrooms. The second compliance finding was around the SCI endorsement. Um, we do submit as a district monthly reports to the Department of Education so that they can monitor us working towards compliance. And our next progress report is actually due tomorrow. <laughs> in terms of the SCI endorsement compliance finding, um, in 2020, 94% of our educators who were required to have that SCI endorsement had already obtained the endorsement. Of the 6% of educators that were not yet endorsed, there were approximately 50 educators that Deb Morrell in our curriculum department has been in constant communication with regarding their status towards endorsement. Currently, approximately 15 of those educators are and will be enrolled in an SEI course um, in, by spring of 2022. Um, other teachers are pursuing alternative ways to receive that endorsement, such as teacher prep programs or by taking the SEI MTEL. The other compliance indicator that has been an ongoing focus in our department is ELE program structure. There has been a lot of work in this area to support our English learners in language development by developing a plan that both increases service minutes and increases how language is embedded throughout the entire instructional day. Since our DESI review, we have offered professional development to educators focused in pursuing the ESL license. As um, we have had ongoing discussions with the Lynn Teachers Union regarding ESL licensure for kindergarten teachers. We have met monthly with a principal group to discuss the elementary schedule structure and ways to address language and content with our students. And we've also been working towards K-2 interdisciplinary unit enhancements to build content and language simultaneously. This area was initially discussed at our March and May 2021 school committee meetings, but we wanted to give you a deeper overview of these enhancements, which will support our students in both language and content. As you can see, our K-2 data indicates an immense need to explicitly focus on language development in ELD and SEI instruction. We are currently 67% identified English learner in grades K-2, with 80% of those students in the early proficient stages of English proficiency, level one and two. In addition to identified Ls, Across all LPS K-2 classrooms, we serve a vast majority of multilingual learners, with 75% of those students speaking a language other than English at home. In 
in our data analysis and discussions with teachers and school leaders, it is constantly noted that the traditional school structure does not allow for time to address the needs of our students, such as English language development, SCI supports, while also addressing all of the required content and language standards for each grade level. A combination of interdisciplinary units and scheduled English language development during the school day will strategically integrate language and content standards in a cohesive way to maximize teaching and learning, while also drastically increasing ESL service time. How? Students will be able to leverage vocabulary, academic language, background knowledge, and skills that repeat throughout a unit to provide multiple opportunities for practice. Since we know that ELD is an important part of our students' academic development, ELD will be offered in two different ways in all K-2 classrooms in order to elevate language development in our early elementary grades. First, all K-2 students, regardless of EL status, will receive integrated ELD. This will be a 35 minute integrated whole group, group ELD lesson, and it would be connected to the interdisciplinary unit. It would be led by an ESL licensed teacher, while non-ESL licensed staff would serve as a support in the classroom during that time. This would be part of the scheduled elementary day for all K-2 students. In addition to the whole group integrated ELD, identified English learners would be able to receive additional language development. So students like newcomers, students who aren't making adequate progress, would be able to receive an additional dose of designated ELD time during the small group instruction time, which is similar to the model that we see currently in our schools. Those groups would be determined by data, formative assessments, things of that nature. A combination of both of these ELD components, integrated and designated, would increase our students' explicit language development from an average of 22.5 minutes to 47 minutes of ESL service per day, while also making connections to language throughout the day in the interdisciplinary units, allowing students to really accelerate their language and content learning. I'm now going to shift over to Amanda Campbell, who has worked with many educators and teachers uh, in the interdisciplinary unit process to talk about that in more depth. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, like Rania said, I'm going to share a little bit more about the interdisciplinary approach to teaching content. Um, the interdisciplinary units are a really powerful cross-content area connection that gives our students the repeated exposure to language and content to really develop mastery as they're building those in a more cohesive way. Um, and so by sequencing the content area cohesively across the year, the standards, we maximize both student time and teacher time. And so these interdisciplinary units, they place the students and the grade level standards at the very core of what we're doing. So in this approach, approach we think about it like this. We teach our kids the grade level standards using interdisciplinary units and big ideas through the use of high quality instructional materials. So in order to develop these units, we think really carefully about who our kids are first and foremost, um, which is why we've spent so much time talking about the demographics. From there, we look at the grade level standards to see where there's connections and overlaps. And I've shared some of those connections before um, in our dual language work. Um, and then finally, we use the high quality instructional materials um, that exist in order to teach those interdisciplinary units. Um, and this is, it's really different from the traditional approach, which often puts fidelity to the resource at the core, as opposed to the needs of our students and fidelity and alignment to the grade level standards. And so these are some examples of texts from the SEI kindergarten maps. Um, there are supplemental mentor texts that we use within the interdisciplinary units. And because our students are at the core of these units, they're selected carefully by considering who our students are in our classrooms, 
the content area standards that the text need to support, and how they connect back to the larger big idea of each unit. And as you can see, there's a really wide variety of texts that are used to meet those standards across content areas, while also providing diverse perspectives that are much more representative of our student body than you would typically see in a published curricula. Um, these interdisciplinary units, um, as I mentioned before, they're already in place in dual language, and they're also in our kindergarten classrooms. So we've gathered some teacher feedback on these units, and we've included some here for you to look at. A few of the highlights include that teachers really appreciate not being limited to a scripted program. They really appreciate the real-world connections for our students and the built-in linguistic supports for our multilingual learners. Thanks, sorry, <laughs> they look so similar. <laughs> um, so in addition to the positive feedback we've received, our teachers have expressed some uh, requests for updates and some changes. Um, and so we've listed here some of that feedback as well. Um, our teachers are interested in additional supplemental resources, a shared drive to house those types of resources, um, some more structure to the weekly guides, and additional support and professional development. Um, we've been carefully collecting all of that feedback all year long. Um, a shout out to Jackie Gallo, who's been really great at collecting that feedback for us. Um, and we plan to incorporate all of those revisions listed here for kindergarten and into the development of the grade one and two units. And so this work in developing the interdisciplinary units, along with some of our other initiatives, including our Seal of Biliteracy program, the implementation of the new language proficiency standards from WIDA. Um, these have all been highlighted across the state. Um, we've had the chance to present um, an, our work in numerous state meetings with other urban directors. Um, we've also seen a really huge outpouring of interest in our um, district LPAC meetings, the EL Parent Advisory Council. We've had an average of 75 participants in our first three meetings of the school year. Um, so we're really excited about the engagement we've had from the community over these past couple months. And we will be back before you next month to talk a little bit more about our dual language program in more depth. Um, but in addition to some of those highlights from ELE, our work in dual language has been highlighted both across Massachusetts and across the nation this fall. Um, we've had the opportunity to sit on panels to share our dual language program. Um, we've presented at some conferences and we are actively supporting other Massachusetts districts as they seek to develop and expand their own dual language programming. And so here are just a few snapshots from some of that national recognition. Um, so in addition to the panels and conferences we've presented at, Compañeros Dual Language has been featured in national presentations and webinars. Um, and it'll also be featured in an upcoming book titled How Data Got Its Groove Back. Um, it will be released later this year. That's the book in the middle. So that is it from us. Thank you so much. Any uh, <clears throat> questions from the committee? Member Gailey. Um, is there any phonics in this? Yes, absolutely. There is? Yeah. Okay. And I've been guaranteed that there's only push in and not pull out. Uh, I'm sorry for what In Jack kindergarten, said. there hasn't been any pull out, but I'm hearing from teachers that there are pull outs instead of push in. And I'm hearing from teachers that um, that they're teaching certain letters or certain things and they get pulled out and then they're being taught something differently, but it's going to be okay because when they all get to bed together eventually, they'll all be on the same page. That's what I was told. So I just want to make sure that they're being pulled in. They are being taught by um, a teacher in ELL and supported by the person in the classroom. I will never agree to a mandated license. I, I spoke to a group during my campaign and um, they liked the idea when I said, why is it every teacher in the state of Massachusetts has to have a master's degree in five years? So I can't understand why we couldn't ask new teachers coming in 
if with the support of Lynn Public Schools, they could get their ELL license instead of mandating teachers. Because I don't know if you know this, I'm sure you do, we've been losing a lot of teachers, and it's not just because of the salary. Salary is part of it, but the fear of having to, after 25 years of teaching, having to go and get an ELL license to teach what they've always been teaching, there was one more thing. Um, is some of the Spanish people in our community believe that when they have that ELL license, then the teachers will be speaking Spanish. And that's not true. The ELL license is just going to give them strategies and approaches to help students to learn. So I just want to make sure that this is happening. And, and I don't know, I'll find out when the survey goes out what's actually happening more. So, but thank you for your presentation and the update. I also looked into a school, I don't know if you've heard of it in Cambridge. It's called the Amigos. Yep. And um, they have the dual language program. They have it in Spanish. They have it in um, Portuguese. And I think they have it in Mandarin. Sure. And I just was checking to make sure that they had phonics because I wasn't sure if we have phonics and I don't know how anyone in kindergarten or first grade can learn how to read if they don't have phonics. However, if, for example, um, Man Nicholson's son goes to the dual language school, I'm sure he will have the support of the mayor and his wife helping them with the English, teaching them phonics. But not everyone has that opportunity. So I am watching this like a hawk. I will never approve of a mandated license. And um, for those teachers out there, the mandated license um, is something that could move very quickly up K, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 12. So if I choose not to approve anything that's in our negotiations, it will be just simply because we cannot afford as a district to lose any more licensed teachers, period. And that I really firmly believe every teacher and staff member in our district that work in our schools, like you asked at the beginning of this meeting, we should be giving them 5%. I think 5% would be good because that would maybe, just maybe, get us in line for a salary. But I wanted to get that out there because if I end up not voting for this, it's going to be because there's a mandate for a license. And I don't think anybody other than the state of Massachusetts, Massachusetts should be mandating a license. Thank you. Oh, and last year we had 70%. This year we have 67. Weird. Spanish speakers. Member Gailey, I just want to say one thing first. I, respectfully, I don't think it's appropriate to refer to my family to make a point about the policy. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tutwiler and then I saw Member Pena. Yeah, I, 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 uh, at the outset, I made clear that no part of this presentation had anything to do with uh, the license. It was simply around the form and function of the day and how we were trying to be thoughtful around meeting uh, the overwhelming majority uh, of our students' needs. I don't know if uh, Amanda or Rania wanted to respond to uh, the idea of students being pulled out. Uh, I will just say that in some of our schools, uh, simply due to the size of classrooms and how many specialists may be pushing in at a particular time, there are settings where teachers do pull out small group for small group instruction, but they do not pull them out during core content instruction. They would pull them out simply during the small group time, but in some rooms you can't physically have so many small group tables in one space. And in some cases, the ESL teachers are pulling out into like a separate little room outside the door or something of that nature. I would also add too that some of the COVID protocols have, have changed the way that we're able to effectively deliver a small group and that sometimes we're not able to maintain the spacing um, that has been recommended to us. So that may change. I would have to see the specifics of the circumstance, but that may be um, a factor as well. Member Pena and then Member Kapoor. Uh, thank you, Amanda and Rania, for the presentation. Um, I had a question. How um, we're at 
of our ELE students are the uh, third on the highest, you know, among the highest in the state. Have we, uh, and I looked at um, the website, Jesse, uh, Chelsea's about 5%, I think they're 40, about almost 5% higher. Have we reached out to Chelsea or Lawrence to see how, what, what other methods are, what, what are they implementing? Have we reached out to them to find out? And, um, you know, I'm happy to see that we're innovated in some areas, you know, we're being innovative in some areas. And um, I like that we're keeping the focus on the students. And um, I like to see us, you know, continue the progress. Thank you. Great. And to your answer, we're constantly working with other urban districts. Uh, Chelsea is a much smaller district, so their numbers are, are much smaller than ours. But Lawrence, today I was just on a call with Revere, Lawrence, Chelsea, Brockton, Springfield, Boston. So we're, we're constantly talking about the issues that are facing English learners across the state, uh, particularly in high EL districts and brainstorming ways to address um, kind of the traditional ways or structures in place across mm. the state that we're all trying to uh, change to benefit our students. Thank you. America Ball. And then member Magnolia. Oh. Um, if, when you say not content, if you were saying the kindergarten, you know, and this is what we hear is, um, you know, if they're being pulled out into the hallway and the teacher inside is maybe doing the, you know, first third of the alphabet, but when they're pulled out, it's totally different part of it. So are you referring to the, like that? So there isn't a matchup to, you know, not not being uniform about you know what's happening in the classroom and then what's being pulled out should oh. they be on the same page right so what we're saying is ESL <clears throat> instruction is supposed to happen right now during small group time so it's not when a teacher is delivering new content or material to students it's when you might have reading intervention or teachers working with small groups reinforcing or providing supports the ESL curriculum is different because language development, ESL, follows a different set of standards than your content area teacher who's teaching the Massachusetts state standard, standards for elementary. So they're addressing two different sets of standards and therefore, yes, the instruction may be different dependent on the student's proficiency level and the language standards that they are teaching. They are not teaching the content area standards as the Massachusetts standards are being taught in the classroom. That's not there, that's not, those are not the standards that they teach. They have a different set of standards and a different curriculum. Okay, my other question is probably not for you, but uh, maybe for them, um, you know, last year at this time we talked about, um, you know, approaching the colleges that are training the teachers in regards to the license, you know, because I reached out to a number of kids that have left Lintech and are in, in programs, uh, teaching programs, and um, their, their thing is they haven't uh, heard a push from their schools in regards to, you know, uh, adding on the license, and, it, and it, they're not overly interested in that either, the students, you know. I think, um, pretty much what we thought maybe last year that they would be um, they want to get out they don't want to spend more time getting an additional license before they graduate so what progress have you made in that do you want to uh, I, yeah parts of the uh, the question I'm not sure that I'm clear so let me make sure I understand first um, when you say um, that students aren't overly interested, you mean in, in attaining an ESL an license? An additional license. They are interested in graduating, getting, you know, getting that initial license, yep. and, and getting out of school. Yep. So I'm wondering what progress we make, because we talked about this last year, yeah. making sure that we are in touch with those schools Absolutely. and they understand what we need. Yeah. So I'll let, do um, you want to talk about our, our work with Salem State around the pre-service teachers? Mm -hmm. And, and Ms. O'Malley's here too, who oversees that. Um, you know, like. we are working with Salem State to um, develop a cadre of teachers. We, we're offering fellowships in areas where we need teachers. Those content areas are math, 
e ESL, and what's the other one? Special Ed. Special Ed. And special education. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, we are engaged in that work with those colleges in, in attempts to recruit. We have fellows currently in the system. Um, are they exclusively at Sewell, Ms. O'Malley? So right. they're at school and um, there are some at the secondary too. Harrington as and well. Harrington. Yeah, so I mean that that's actively up and going and, and we're looking to expand that in next school year. There is an interest in it. Okay. And I would just add and I saw you wanted to add something. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to a student who said I don't have an interest in earning an additional yes. license, but I'll tell you uh, much as I did last year, the idea of um, a an English teacher, for example, being also required to have an ESL license is not foreign. In the Boston Public Schools, in the secondary level, at my high school, when I was at Brighton High School, if you're an English teacher, you had to have an ESL license also. They required it. Uh, and so, you know, the, the interest is one thing, but if you're going to work in a community serving the population that we're serving, you know, that is an important piece of understanding what those students need and how they learn and best meeting their needs. And, uh, and I'm not questioning, you know, that piece with you. I'm just questioning that, um, you know, we're struggling to keep up with the losses in the teaching here, you know, um, like, you know, in the back of our agenda, mm -hmm. you know, we have highest and they're all, you know, not certified, not certified, not certified. So, you know, obviously it's a concern to me. I, I want us to have certified teachers mm -hmm. teaching in, you know, all of the different um, areas. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're struggling and we're hiring people that aren't certified for any particular thing, then it's, it's doubly hard to try to. And th that's, what, that's the concern I have is that, you know, Let's face it, when you're young and you're coming out of college and you, you, you want that one license and you want to move along and you, you'll look someplace else than to look for us. And I'm concerned about the staffing that we put. I, I, I'm with Miss um, Gately as far as I don't support a mandatory license. But, you know, I'm, I support that we're uh, doing things and we're, that we're giving them the extra support it's absolutely necessary but um, I do have concerns about the license package. understood uh, one quick comment if I may and then I'll, then I'll let you answer maybe two comments uh, the first uh, really quickly is um, I don't I, I would caution looking at the personnel um, scenario for our district right now and drawing a large conclusion because we all know that this context is unique and extremely challenging not just in this district in every district in the state probably across the country as we read about and see that teachers are leaving for lots of different reasons and districts are doing their level best to find people to come in and support the needs of students and sometimes they're they, they don't have their license. Thank goodness the state has in place an emergency uh, license waiver that someone can apply for and get right away. So I, I just wanted to uh, offer uh, that, that caution there. And then, um, you know, the idea, we, right now, um, there is no second license offered or required uh, in, in any grade. So uh, that is a topic that's being discussed in negotiations, I, I don't know that it's appropriate for us to be having this conversation out here, given that it's a, a, a negotiations topic. Okay, I think I had, oh yeah. I have to cut her off. Yeah, 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 please. Well, that's okay, I was just going to add um, to your question about reaching out to local colleges mm -hmm. um, in our work to build a bilingual pipeline, which we'll talk about more in February and in my role in the ELE office. Um, I've met with, I think, pretty much every field office director, executive director in all of the local colleges, and we've placed many of their um, practicum students and pre-practicum students um, in the Lynn Public Schools. And uh, from what I've heard, people are really excited to have the opportunity to work in the Lynn Public Schools because we're one of the largest districts in the area, and they really get a, a good look at what it's like to be an urban educator. Um, so we've started to build some really great relationships with them. I've met with Merrimack, Endicott, BU, BC, Salem State, um, I'm sure I'm missing some, but I've met with pretty much everybody and they're all really receptive to the idea of placing students here for their 
pre-practicum and practicum experiences. Just and, and I'll also just quickly add, we interview lots of staff. Uh, we have a lot of EL, uh, ELE staff and teachers. Many ESL staff usually don't start as ESL staff, right? It's because there's an opportunity mm -hmm. and then they end up being long time ESL staff and they are very appreciative of the opportunity to get support in professional development and in our district working with our students. And once they start working with our students, they fall in love with ESL. Mm -hmm. um, and they also appreciate the marketability that they now, you know, in terms of being able to say, I can teach ESL, I can teach grade two, mm. you know, they're more marketable, mm -hmm. they, they, they can do more in our district, but sometimes ESL is also what gets them in the door by pursuing that license because not many colleges and universities may have robust ESL programs at this time. I, I just had a question, how many fellowships oh, oh, do we have right now? I think it's four. Oh, four. Okay. Thank you, Eva. Yeah. If I can add also that we do have um, uh, initiatives where we do MCAL prep. We have MCAL prep and we have vouchers that we can help people um, to get like an ESL license or communication and literacy. Thank you. So I had Member Magnolia, Member Castellanos, and then Member Dugan. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have a super nuts and boltsy question about um, when all students get their ELD led by the ESL teacher, I know the majority of our ESL students um, speak Spanish, but I am particularly interested in how during that type of direct instruction for our students who speak languages like Arabic that do not have a Latinate alphabet, how um, integrated is the teaching of an alphabet system because we're talking about grades in which the alphabet is being learned. So if you could just talk just briefly about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the interesting thing about navigating alphabetic versus non-alphabetic scripts um, is that when you start off in kindergarten, the best way to build up that understanding is through a lot of oral practice, um, which is exactly what kindergarten is designed to do and what's also exactly what ELD is designed to do. So by giving kids a really healthy dose of oral language development right at the outset, um, leading into lots of opportunities for what we call like share the pen writing or modeled writing. I'm holding the pen, I'm writing for you, I'm modeling that left to right directionality. You're giving me some input, you're saying, oh miss, can you please put that? I put my snow boots on first and I'm holding the pen and I'm saying, oh, which side of the paper do I start on? Although, especially for our youngest learners, they haven't yet had the opportunity to build literacy in that first language. So in some ways, it's easier to start with that um, left to right orientation. In other ways, it is more difficult to build literacy in a language you're not yet proficient. Um, but all of those opportunities for guided practice and then, oh, do you want to come up? Would you like to put the letter P in here? Um, all of those types of things are really, really helpful for all students. Um, and then obviously the ELD instruction is entirely in English so that all students, first of all, because it's a, you know, an English immersion program, um, but also all students then gain access to it. Um, we also really recommend that teachers because it's a really student-centric approach that teachers know and understand who their students are and where they've come from. So if I know I have an Arabic speaker and I have seven Spanish speakers, when I put up my cognates, I'm gonna include both. You know, there are a lot of influences from Arabic to English um, and vice versa that you can pull to show kids like, hey, that word sounds almost the same in both languages, let's put it on our chart. Um, and so that's a really great opportunity to, to also show value for those languages. Thank you. Yep. Member Castellanos. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Always well put together. I want to congratulate you on national, gain, gaining that national attention and putting you know, this program and everyone you know, on the map. It's uh, very important work that you're doing. Um, I think my colleagues, you know, everyone has voiced you know, very valid points. I definitely, this is a very, not, you know, this is a very, this is a very important uh, initiative. This is very important. When you look at our trends, like you said, over the last decade, it's going up. You can't ignore it. So we have to strategize and figure out ways um, to col collaborate and, and innovate. Desi, you know, and I understand that we're going to be meeting with them tomorrow. I know you have a progress report on the 14th. You said? Is that tomorrow? We submit a. Uh, Excuse me. I'm, I'm losing track of time. Yeah. So tomorrow. So, you know, what, what, what are we looking So, when we. What is the conversation looking like with the commissioner? How are they how how are they supporting us? And if they see the trends that we're looking at right now, we're seeing, and I understand you, we're working every day with the with the with the, with the state. We I understand, you know, what are they doing to incorporate support 
you know, I would like to kind of have a, a conversation around that because we are up against a big challenge. We're seeing growing trends. Um, we obviously we we just we're going through a pandemic that we just just keep getting hit with. Um, and RLs, you know, if you look at certain uh, you know data points of dropout, and you see you know there's concerns there. What is the what is Desi doing? What does that look like? So, you, you know, I, I want to be clear that. Um, the report uh, that is due tomorrow is really around our progress towards uh, things that are anchored in compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, Rania and Amanda's relationship with their liaisons uh, at, at DESI is really around, you know, what are the rules and, and like, how, what are we doing to meet them, uh, to be clear. Um, I, I would say separate and apart from that, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are financial supports uh, from the federal government, uh, Title III. Um, I, I'd say, uh, you know, there is an Office of Language Acquisition, I think that's what yes. it is, yeah. at DESI, which, is, which does consult with districts to provide guidance and support as we, as we navigate. Uh, I, I would say, as of late, um, they might be picking our brain more than we're picking theirs, uh, just to be clear, as you uh, heard in the presentation. Um, but, but um, you know, it, it's, not a, I, it's not a difficult relationship, I just want to be clear, and I feel like that there are supports, they're accessible. Um, and, you, you know, from the standpoint of the commissioner, I mean, there's, there's been, at least as long as he's been in that role, a real, uh, commitment uh, to addressing the needs of English learners. So, so that being said, kind of a segue into my next point. I appreciate that, that explanation. So for your, so for the program structure, I know we, we discussed the ESL internship from Salem State. I, I really appreciate that, and um, the opportunities for MTEL vouchers. You know, when I see this point, I think about how how are they are we. How are we capturing the access? Are are, are we are, is the staff accessing? You know how we how are we collecting that? Like if is this a like if this is a compliance point that we're looking at right there? Correct? Is that what you say? So one of the request compliances from this, from Desi, your liaison, you're going to say this is what we're doing, right? Do we have kindergarten staff accessing these resources for MTEL vouchers? Like how like do we have a number? So I don't know about the vouchers. I know that many kindergarten teachers participated in our professional development course that ran over the summer. Um, we have uh, had a couple reach out in terms of internship opportunities um, for that. Um, uh, Debbie Morell in curriculum gathers the data for the, the vouchers, so I, I don't necessarily know the number to that exactly. I, I want to talk about this because our staff have been working tremendously. Mm -hmm. Tremendously, and when I see this, I see effort, and I want to make sure that folks are getting that straight. When you, we speak to our liaison, and let them know that our staff have been working very diligently to hit those marks. And then let me tell you something: through this pandemic, our staff have been through hell, and to hit those and then those requirements, that extra, we have some of the most resilient staff in this district, in the state, and we can argue that all day long, respectfully. And I do. I appreciate your hard work, and I want to make sure that our staff, are, our staff, are getting that recognition as well. And and I do, you know, when, when I when we see the you know the, the feedback that we're getting, are we getting the feedback through the principal discussions, or how we collect the feedback directly through just all the staff them like just. Could you just kind of talk about that? Yep, absolutely. Um, so Jackie Gallo, who is our Assistant Director for Curriculum and Instruction Early Childhood Education, she holds monthly workshops with the kindergarten staff. At the conclusion of each workshop, there's a survey where teachers have the opportunity to reflect both on the content of the PD, the structure of the, of the workshops that they're running, and the maps. Um, and so we've been able to collect, we, that's directly these pieces of information, these are all direct quotes or, or a summary and compilation of several quotes um, that come straight from educators in their survey. So thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. How are we doing? Okay. Uh, so I just want to read it. Brian said thank you uh, for all your hard work uh, and your national recognition and state recognition. That's great to see. So thank you for that. A uh, couple nuts and bolts questions. Uh, the first one, uh, it sounds like so there'll be team teaching with the ESL teachers and the classroom teachers uh, for 35 minutes. Did I is that correct? Okay. So it's not 
team teaching well, per se, right? Okay. The ESL teacher <coughs> is leading the instruction. Correct. So yeah. they're planning based on, again, the language standards. So okay. WIDA, which mm -hmm. is the state mm -hmm. standards. Yep. And um, so they're, they're leading the instruction specifically in language development, but it's connected to the unit. So okay. the, the unit big idea or language or vocabulary is part of that language instruction. Um, and the general education teacher is in the classroom at the time, okay. but really the ESL teacher is the one leading that the time. They are the ESL licensed teacher teaching those standards. Okay. So that obviously would involve common planning time. Have we worked that into the schedule for the teachers where they can collaborate and, you know, come up with these plans or is that something that's in the works or? So scheduling is done at the building level. Each building sets okay. up their individual planning structures. Um, the benefit of having the really cohesive mapping approach um, is that it allows everybody to know we're within this unit, we're within this, okay. you know, these language functions, these language topics. Um, so the ESL teacher would be the one, it, again, it will vary by building because obviously some classrooms have mm. seven L's, some classrooms have 27 L's. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the planning might look different at each building, but ideally the ESL teacher is putting together the plan, planning it out, building out exactly what it is, and then the, um, the paraprofessional and the classroom teacher within the classroom might be working with um, the turn-in talks as they're doing them. Um, it sort of depends right. on if, if they have a couple small groups running, maybe they have one independent application activity. That's um, how the classroom teacher would be supporting that. So it's not quite as involved as co-teaching would right. be, where you really absolutely mm -hmm. need that planning time. But ideally, yeah, we would love to see buildings be able to put um, planning time in. Great, all right, thank you, that was that, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you again for the presentation. I mean, those those uh, statistics you shared at the beginning of the presentation are, are really um, arresting in the in the uh, need that it identifies, particularly just the increase, but also the increase relative to our peers. Obviously, something is happening that we need to pay close attention to and, and appreciate uh, the leadership that that uh, you all are showing and in, in, in doing so. And also uh, to Member Castellanos's point, the the, the team. That, is, that are in the classrooms are that are that are doing this every day um, to to make it work and, and and the families that are reinforcing that work at home. So so thank you for that. Great. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. We'll see you next month. <laughs> Good luck with the submission thank tomorrow. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So heading into new business. Um, a and B are two votes to cancel the fourth regular meeting scheduled for February 24th and the fifth regular meeting scheduled for March 10th. Um, due to conflicts, I think we typically do those canceling and, and probably would want to reschedule uh, meeting dates if we can do that while we're all together here. Um, so uh, pull out the calendars here. How does March 3rd look for people? March 3rd. That's the Thursday before that, right? You're right, in between the two, so. Yeah, I think that works for me. March 3rd. Not. Anybody have a problem with it? Or? March 3rd? I could say yes for now, but I might have to follow up. I sure it looks good for me. What date? Yes. Okay. Uh, does someone want to? Yeah, I'll make a motion that um, we cancel um, the fourth regular meeting scheduled for February 24, 2022, and the fifth regular meeting scheduled for March 10, 2022, and um, set a meeting for March 3rd. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, please. Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gailey? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. All right. The next item on the agenda is spectators at events. Dr. Tellweiler. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, the committee received uh, a communication uh, on January 3rd uh, indicating a unanimous decision among all Greater Boston League uh, school districts to 
pause athletics uh, for approximately one week. Uh, it resumed uh, this week, actually. Uh, but at the bottom of that memo, it mentioned uh, there was a statement around each district creating their own policy specific to spectators uh, at the events. Um, and I've been in contact with uh, both uh, our nursing director as well as the city's health director. Um, and they are prepared to support uh, what the vast majority of Greater Boston League teams are doing, uh, which is to allow uh, two spectators per uh, athlete uh, at the events uh, temporarily. Um, there are, just to be clear, there, there is one school district, uh, Somerville, that's allowing no spectators, and then there's one school district that has uh, no restrictions whatsoever, and that's uh, Medford, and all the rest are doing two uh, per athlete. Um, they will come up with a system that works, whether it's the, the student athletes identifying, you know, it's you know, Pat Tutwiler and Jared Nicholson are my two people, uh, if we're so lucky uh, <laughs> to be <laughs> two people. Uh, and then they would have someone at the table to check those two people and have them in. My recommendation would be to go with that, not just for English and Classical, which are the two Greater Boston League uh, schools, but also for Lynn Tech, uh, and revisit it on February 10th. Um, there was one other point that I wanted to make. Oh, and this it's this one, and this is more of an anecdotal kind of piece just to kind of keep in mind. Uh, and talking with uh, the high school principals today, uh, one talked about how, uh, you know, this is kind of addressed itself. Uh, attendance at games was already uh, pretty low, mm -hmm. but we think making a strong statement around safety by going this route uh, would be good just in the short term. Dr. Topa, I just want to note that the middle schools are following the same protocols. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Any questions? Does that need to be in a form of a motion or can we just accept um, the decision made by Dr. Tetwiler? I think, um, do you have a preference, Dr. Tetwiler? I think we can we can take a vote if, if people are want to ratify it. Kay. If someone wants to make a motion. Yeah. Sure, I'd like to move that we support that statement with regards to the spectating levels for athletic events. I second it. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Just one question on that, and the, t the visiting teams will understand that. Uh, they also will be permitted to spectators, yeah. so right. it's going to be a, uh, a uniform uh, approach. So, you know, if, uh, you know, Medford was coming in, uh, the AD will communicate uh, to the Medford uh, athletic director that mm -hmm. it's two per athlete and they'll set up a system to invite those guests in when they arrive. Okay, and there was a game that was canceled today that we're not back in canceling. I think it was girls basketball, English classical. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to get back oh. to you on the specifics right. around that, but I know that there's uh, the boys are playing. It might have been uh, COVID related, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is discussion regarding signing of warrant, Mr. McHugh. Uh, thank you. Um, in your packet, I put a uh, handout that you've probably seen. And then I know we have some new members, but uh, prior to 2016, every month we put out a, a warrant of all the bills of all our vendors and we pay once a month through the city. So we received that and we, we, we required to get majority of the school committee to sign it. So that seem to be a problem not only with us but as you can see there's legislation that was passed because it's a require a possibility that to get four people to out of this committee to come in and sign once a month on a regular basis or in a timely fashion because to get the bills out and get people paid it became an issue so they passed this back in 2016 so we had john ford uh the committee chose john ford and he agreed and luckily he was a retiree and it was easy he lives in town right down the street he would come in review the bills come in and sign within a day we get it over to city hall and the, the checks could be sent out to vendors so now that john's no longer on the committee uh it'd be up to this board and i don't need a decision tonight i just put it on the agenda night for discussion purposes mm -hmm. the warrant doesn't come out to the end of january we have a meeting scheduled january 27th so that should be right around when the warrant would come out so unless somebody really wants to do it or the committee wants to elect someone to do that we could go this way um, 
or you know if your committee feels that they want to go back the old way they would have that choice so as of right now we do not have an authorized person and we would need a vote of the school committee to authorize also for informational purposes every school committee person does get the monthly warrant electronically sent to them uh, you know every month so you have the chance to review it if you ever have questions you're welcome to contact me directly some people in the past will they'll call me and say what's this for I don't understand and this so we just I will provide that information to that individual as need be so there's always that chance you'll still get it you just don't have to come in and sign so and I'm open to the committee's wishes we had <coughs> Member Coppola, then Member Gailey, yeah. Okay. Member Coppola? Or was that, a, you volunteering I, I to was, do it? No, yeah. I wasn't oh. volunteering, oh. I was volunteering <laughs> Lenny Pena. Oh, terrific, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. He yeah. in that. He was Wonderful. questioning that, and he showed an interest, so. Excellent, yeah, I'm all Someone for that. Someone shows an interest, you, you <laughs> grab him right away. Absolutely, that's, no, no that's a great service. Uh, I'll flex him. Yeah, yeah. I'll flex terrific. All, all over the city. Yeah, yeah, Member yeah. Gailey. Um, when we first got on the committee, I found it very um, useful to read through the warrants because we had to sign every month. Mm -hmm. um, I highly recommend that everybody does that, and I would like to work with Lenny, reading through it, signing it. If he has any questions, him and I could do it because I am now retired, so I have a little extra time. Not a lot, but a little. Thank you, Member Gately, Member yeah. Castellanos. So I, I do have the... I, I do work for the state. I have an ethic question. Um, no, not to say I'm not in agreement with it, Lenny. He does work for the city in a way, in a capacity. Is that is that okay? Is that authorized? Are, do, are we walking into he, the city? He works, I believe, for the water department. That's a separate entity, all completely okay, so. set up as they're not pay, funded by the city. They're a separate entity, uh, completely. So that would not be an issue. We don't, and also we do not pay. I mean, obviously, there are this. We don't pay the water bills here out of the school budget. If there are water bills, they're paid from the city hall, so that wouldn't even be anything. He's not approving anything that would uh, affect him, unless he owns a business that does. Anyone that owns a business does uh, business with the Lynn Public Schools wouldn't be eligible to sign. No, I understand. It just, it just in terms of just for Lenny's, per he's you know he's got to still check in with his employer. I think that's still fair. I think you would be. You should have a conversation just because it's just, in terms of just they are even the L entity. I think that'd be something that I just want to bring up. Yep. I no, I, 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 again, you know, I'm not sure what time he gets out of work at the end of the day, but you know, if he gets out of work at like 3:30, we're open for a little bit. We we've made arrangements for in the past if for extended time or working around whatever their schedule is. Just that we only ask that it, once the warrant comes out, you know, within a day or so because it, the checks, they like to send the checks out on a Thursday at City Hall and if they don't, we don't have a signature on it, they can't send them out till that time. Then what happens is we get a lot of phone calls from vendors saying, you know, when am I getting paid? Because we only pay once a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people want to get paid. We would like to get those out at that point. I just want to make sure that Member Pena knows what he's signing up for. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell him. <laughs> I promise that's having sewage on me. <laughs> Member Magnolia. Do we need a vote to have Member Pena? Okay, I'd like to move that Member Pena sign the warrants. Second. Motion, man, second. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. Uh, next item is the fiscal year 2022 net school spending update. Dr. Talwar, Mr. McHugh. Do you want me to take it? Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I just I, since we have some new members again, I just kind of put together. Uh, I'd like to uh, some new members. I'd like to take a minute to provide a brief overview of the net school spending in Chapter 70, uh, just so hopefully you'll have a better understanding. Each year, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education (DESE) determines the amount of funds uh, each school district is required to spend on education. This amount is called net school spending. Net school spending is based upon a lot of factors, but the simple explanation is that net school spending is based upon the city's ability to pay and what the Department of Education feels should be spent on education. So once they determine what the city's ability is to ability to pay, they fill in the rest with Chapter 70 funding to give us the rest. For example, I just use these, just to keep it simple, if, if net school spending is $100,000, the city's ability to pay is 25000 then they give a chapter 70. So it's built upon the city's ability first, 
then chapter 70. Some people think it's the other way around. It's not. So that's the way the process works. At, as to the end of each fiscal year, we are required to complete a report to the state of all the school expenditures. This report also includes uh, all the budget expenditures as well as any funds the city expended towards education. And they call those in-kind contributions. So, for example, uh, the majority of the city expenses are health insurance, because if you looked at our budget book, which I'm on all the new members got, there's no health insurance in there. The school custodians are all on the city side, and all the maintenance costs. Those are the probably three biggest buckets of monies that uh, the city expends for us. There are some administrative costs, because they do process, again, as a warrant, and they hand that some of those costs are in, but they're very small amounts. So after the, submit, the submission of this year's report, uh, we believe that we, the city believes we might be a little short on the meeting net school spending. And the reasoning for that is the health insurance costs have gone down. So every year we budget, just like we do, we submit a budget, and our budget is this, and we expend the budget. Typically, we expend our full budget because we, you know, we need to make sure we meet that school spending. So it's based on most of our budget, as you'll see if you look through the book, it's like 80% salaries, and the rest are transportation, sped, and some other supply cost. So with that said, there is a deficiency at this date. We believe there's going to be a deficiency every year we get a letter if there's a deficiency. If we don't, we don't get a letter. But as of right now, we have not received any communication from the Department of Ed about showing any type of deficiency to us. However, in talking with the city CFO, he alluded to me that his city health insurance costs came in a lot less than what he believed they would have been. So we believe that we're going to be a little bit short on net school spending. If you are short, every year they take that difference that you're short and just add it to the, this current year. So that's what would happen. So at this point, he is willing, he's going to go to the city council on January 25th and ask them to appropriate an additional $900,000 to the Lynn School Department. Mm. Mm. So uh, we just learned about this just over the holiday period, over conversations back and forth. So. Once we get that, we'll come back to you with some more information. Once, if, this, if the city council approves that, I assume they will. Mm -hmm. If they give it to us, we'll then put it into our budget and talk to you at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, it's a fluid situation, but mm -hmm. if we get a letter, that'll tell us exactly what the difference is. But based on the CFO's health insurance number, he thinks that's going to cover us and get us mm -hmm. back to 100% net school spending. Okay. So if there's any questions, I, hopefully I can answer them for you. We had Member Capola. Um, what was the addition? I would, I would, I hope that the City Council does approve that 900000 because we s certainly still have things going on that we really need it for. Um, but in particular, I don't want to see us get into the predicament we did a few years back where we, we didn't reach 100% net school spending and we were fined and you know, we paid, we paid the price for that for quite a few budgets. And um, that just hurt our students and staff, you know, as far as, um, you know, paying that back. Right. I, and, I don't believe that's the case. Services. Based on my looking at it, you know, because I, I actually put all the numbers in yeah. and I get the city numbers, they give me those, so I don't have any input on where they come from or how that, but based on my thing, I, I think his numbers did come in less. I agree with that. But... Uh, we haven't got it, and usually you'll December. We've always received yeah. those letters, we, and we're in January now. We haven't received anything. Okay. So, yeah. uh, if we're just short a little bit, like nine hundred, that's like you know less than. It's a very small percentage. So don't tell the city yeah. council that. We would <laughs> we would prefer to have the nine hundred. Well, well, well <laughs> either way, either way, Mr. <laughs> Pola, as I yeah. stated, mm -hmm. if we are short nine hundred and they do nothing, it gets added to this year. Okay. So then they're going to have to make it up anyway. Yeah. So that's okay. the rules. Okay. Uh, I don't see, uh, you know, them taking, you know, or using the funds differently to, you know, short short change us in the, mm. in the numbers. Uh, mm. I, I think, you know, we had those discussions way back when. I remember those. And I remember Ms. Cap uh, Capano sitting here and asking the same questions. And we had those dis clear discussions about where we thought we were going to be. Right. I don't, I would sit here and tell you, I don't see that. Okay. Uh, I don't see a drastic drop. If anything, they've been providing additional uh, compensation, you know, or salaries uh, funding to us. So I think we're going to be okay uh, this year. Um, 
you know, it's still early. Um, I'm trying to see, and you know, we, there may be some more discussion about this as we go forward. Because the good news is, I think the CFO and I've been talking on, like we we talk, said in the past, on a somewhat regular basis yeah. to communicate. So we're on the same page, and I think that's a good thing. I, I really think that's a positive that we're all in it together. And uh, you know, I know uh, the former mayor. I'm sure you know the, this current mayor, being a former school committee, is going to be you know feeling that we need to be you know getting our education what we deserve to get. As you know, because nobody wants to get in that problem again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Member Paul, I, I would just say it's um, it's a great point. It was an important uh, takeaway from what happened several years ago, and I think that's exactly why we're on top of this now and addressing it in the way that we are. Um, so appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Uh, fiscal year 2023, budget timeline priorities. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay with budget. Uh, in your packets you received, I believe it's a nine-step uh, approach to developing the budget. It's more of a timeline. I uh, just wanted to say a few words uh, about it. Uh, while I would say that we're excited to begin the FY23 uh, budget planning, in reality, those conversations are well underway and have been for some time. That said, uh, what you have before you outlines as accurately as I can say at the present moment our plans to develop the FY23 budget. Uh, I'll start by saying that we have plenty of stakeholder input to bring to bear on that effort. We have the existing strategic plan and student opportunity act plan. Further, we know what families and the broader community feels is important uh, for students for students learning uh, at the present moment and in the short term, uh, which we collected uh, pretty substantively through the our, our work to develop the ESSER three uh, alloca allocation plan. The key here is to put all of the pieces of the puzzle together in a way that maximizes the experience and outcome for our students. More concretely, next week we will hold a principal director meeting, at which time we will review this timeline as well as present them with a new bed budget reflection framework. Uh, I personally am really excited uh, about this. I might be alone on that, but um, I'm excited about it. Um, um, about this mechanism for capturing their best thinking around the needs for the 22-23 school year. This framework will, framework will allow us to capture the essence of, their need, of the needs, understand the rationale. Uh, it will also provide for us a bird's eye view on what strategic objectives are emphasized, what acceleration pillars are emphasized, and will help us easily point out leadership and direct service positions. More to come there. It's, it's just about ready, and again, I'm, I'm excited about it. Through the months of January and February, we'll engage in an effort to understand the requests and begin putting the pieces together, all the while consulting the feedback-rich documents that we've already composed. Once the governor's budget is released and the city has a chance to do its analysis, we'll be given a final number, which will allow us to begin finalizing our proposal. You will note uh, in this uh, timeline that there's mention of a Student Opportunity Act amendment. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is holding uh, webinars uh, on exactly what that is, and ours is scheduled for next Tuesday. Uh, so at our next meeting, I'll come back and report uh, exactly what the deal is with that. Uh, but I know that that amendment is due in April, and I've also scheduled time uh, to mm -hmm. present more formally what we what our best thinking is around shifts or changes uh, that we would make uh, relative to that funding. Um, and finally, uh, we always attempt to round the final corner in May. I don't know that it's ever happened. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we will try uh, once again and keep trying uh, as uh, the timeline outlines. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Member Magnolia. Thank you. Um, out of curiosity, um, you said that you have a lot of stakeholder information already. And I'm wondering about the, the combination of formal and informal processes to gather the stakeholder information, particularly how information from each school's council is incorporated into this. So can you talk a little bit about the formal and informal mechanisms yeah. for gathering this information? Yeah. So the, the formal ones uh, came actually somewhat through uh, informal processes. So you think about 
uh, you know, two years ago with the Student Opportunity Act plan. Uh, there were in-person meetings held with community members, families, students. Um, Sheila and I uh, just walked out, uh, went school to school talking with teachers about uh, what was important to them. Uh, there were formal surveys that were also connected to the development of that document. Um, I would say the same is so for the ESSER three grant that was more survey yep. uh, focused. Uh, but you do raise a good point about the importance of the uh, school site councils uh, being involved uh, in the and in giving input on the development of uh, of the development. In years past, we have asked principals to have conversations at uh, the school site council meetings uh, to share kind of the you know from the principal standpoint what they think the priorities are, but to get input from other members of their council, and we actually required that. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. th that, that box had to be checked before we would sit down with them and discuss, uh, and we, we will do that again this year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I, I just want to say, I don't know that that happened last year, but last year, no, I think things, things were, were off. Year. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. year is a tough year, but we'll get it <laughs> done we'll, this year. We'll do it this year. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next item on the agenda is the operating protocol review. Dr. Tawala. Yeah, that, that's me. And, and uh, I, I apologize because I think uh, the descriptor or the term review might be a little bit of a misnomer. But, um, you know, in your package you received a copy of um, the Lynn School Committee operating protocols. Um, this is a document uh, that we collaborati collaboratively developed, Lynn School Committee, Lynn Public Schools Administration. Uh, in my first year as superintendent, I think we spent actually a couple of meetings really uh, diving deep and uh, discussing, um, you know, at a high level, how we're going to work together. Uh, I really love this document. Um, I, I love the statement at the very beginning, and I love how uh, it breaks down really clearly three, um, three pillars uh, that uh, we both commit to, and then, um, you know, substantively what sort of actions um, we're, we, we commit to engaging to make those, those pillars real. Uh, and so uh, this was developed again uh, three years ago. Uh, it was updated last February, uh, excuse me, last April. Um, and our plan is, uh, I mean, it's still a live, and, and, uh, a live document right now. Uh, our plan is to revisit this uh, w whenever our summer retreat is scheduled and we'll, because we'll, we'll, we've got new members, uh, and we'll give this uh, a fresh look uh, but because this is um, such an important document and represents the commitments that we make to working with one another, uh, we thought it important to, A, uh, given that this is the first meeting for, for new members, to, to bring this to the fore, uh, B, to uh, commit to having a laminated copy in your packet uh, each, each time we meet uh, for reference, uh, and then C, um, I, I propose that this be a standing agenda item once per month uh, where we take the time to really make it a living document and have a discussion around how we're doing with, uh, with the, what we've committed to. Um, so we really wanted to, I wanted to take the time uh, in this meeting, uh, the chair as well, just to, to bring these forward. Um, acknowledge that they're, they're really important in terms of the agreements that we make and working with another, one another and then um, just sort of lay out a, a, a rhythm where we would revisit these and, and check in to see how we're doing with it. Thank you, Dr. Tutwiler. Member Pena. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Tutwiler. I, uh, reading this, uh, it, it was great to read the, uh, the school committee operating protocols and um, I support it, you know, I, I, support, I support the language and it, it's good to have it as a living document, but uh, I'd like to see us, you know, when we get the uh, report from the survey, from the parent and the staff, maybe if there's anything that we could add to it after that and we can bring this back to another meeting. And, um, I'd also like to see it be, um, you know, the document be interactive. For example, you know, there could be some hyper, you know, there could be some hyperlinks to cer certain, uh, especially things that make sense. So, so if you have things that need, uh, data 
um, you know, parent information, you know, th things, things like that, you know, information, you know, documents that they can search. For example, if someone hits the goals, you know, superintendent goals, it'll go directly, uh, send a, a link directly to the goals, you know, things like that, just to make it interactive, especially for guys like me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> make it absolutely. easy, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, like the, I like the language and I support it. That's great. Thank you, Mara Pena. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Selwell, for the presentation. Look forward to uh, revisiting these with the with the group when we set aside more time um, to do that and to uh, you know honoring these and, and working with these as we as we move forward. All right. So the next item is the school committee subcommittee assignments. So I have uh, assignments here and, and just wanted to put it on, on the agenda so we could explain um, a little bit about what we did here. Uh, I think it'll, for the most part, look familiar. Um, but basically, um, we worked hard to honor people's preferences um, in assigning the subcommittees. Uh, and well, for the most part, the list is probably familiar. Uh, we there were a couple subcommittees that hadn't really been. Um, th th wh whose business was being taken care of in other forums, um, the the grant subcommittee, um, uh, you know, the district has made a lot of progress on grants, and uh, w w there was a feeling that there was no longer a need for the particular subcommittee. The other one that you'll see here that's not there um, is the finance subcommittee. Not because it, it's not very important what we do, but we've typically done the budget all together uh, as a group, and 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 no one sort of submitted that as a, as a top preference, and so we felt like. Uh, we could give that a, a shot and then member Cassianos um, requested the the addition of a diversity equity and inclusion subcommittee um, and so uh, we, we we added that as well um, the other the other thing I wanted to note is that uh, we, we did work really hard to honor people's preferences obviously it wasn't possible for all of them um, but one in particular the buildings and grounds subcommittee every member had that <laughs> <laughs> it was one of their top priorities, which which it's obviously one of the top priorities for the district. Yeah. So I totally understand, um, and I think it's a, just a good indication that a lot of what we do, uh, we are all interested in have a stake in. And so I think for a lot of those topics, you know, we're we're, we're best served by having those on the on the agenda when we're all you know here and on the committee, um, because we're all very interested in, and engaged. And some of these subcommittees, I think, can be can be more useful when, when, it, when they're sort of specialized topic that maybe you're not as interested in having the whole, or not needed as having the whole group there together. Um, so uh, that's the plan. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, Mayor Castellanos. So I want to thank, uh, thank you, Mayor Nicholson and your, and your staff and your team for, for meeting with us. I know you took time with, you know, with this transition and, and really hearing us out and what, you know, what we're, Looking forward to the next few years, and I appreciate the DEI subcommittee um, addition. Uh, I believe it's very important uh, that we have that platform, and yeah, I look forward to collaborating with my fellow colleagues in, in the district and constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Member Castellanos. Thank you. Great. So, to uh, consider moving the superintendent. Okay. So uh, the next item is request for executive sessions. I'm open to a motion uh, to amend the agenda to move uh, section uh, nine, to testing my Roman numeral reading, to the top of the uh, agenda where we are now if we want to do that before we break for executive session. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. So then that brings us to communications and information. So in your uh, packets, there's an enrollment uh, report, uh, the report reflect, uh, reflecting January 1st, um, the annual report for the North Shore Consortium, uh, and then I've got a superintendent's report uh, with some updates. Um, so I happen to believe that an educator's professional calendar is among the best. In the span of nine to ten months, we have two opportunities to reflect on and make commitments to personal and professional goals. With the onset of the 2022 calendar year, we were presented another opportunity to take stock, 
to reflect and make plans and or renewed commitments for the remainder of the school year, but also the calendar year ahead. A school year in, in, the con in this context is not going to be without challenge. But as we began the new calendar year, our commitment to providing an excellent education in, in a safe and healthy environment remains our foremost commitment. Our venture into 2022 calendar year has presented predictable challenges related to COVID-19. The holiday surge in positive cases has not spared our community. Nonetheless, schools remain open and in-person services continue. We believe we'll be able to sustain this and are following a robust multi-layered set of protocols, the same that we proposed at the beginning of the school year. Monitoring for illness and staying home when ill, mask wearing, ventilation upgrades, cleaning and sanitizing, health and hygiene strategies at schools, and then opportunities to get the vaccine. What is more, uh, we have resumed weekly testing for all students who uh, have consented in staggered fashion. Next week, uh, all schools will be in that queue. Uh, this additional approach to safety will e expand to all, school all schools next week. To be clear, positive COVID cases are inescapable. Nonetheless, we can limit the spread by fidelity to the multi-layered approach described above. And where appropriate and necessary, we will close a classroom or other small defined section to prevent the spread. This will be done, this will continue to be done in consultation with the city's health director, our liaison at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and as a last resort. Each school year, we develop a set of district-wide goals designed to meet student needs first and foremost, and to bring us closer to meeting one or more of the four objectives in our strategic plan. Additionally, when we develop a budget proposal for the upcoming school year, we align it with the strategic plan by illustrating how proposals work in service of meeting the strategic objectives. We do this intentionally because we believe in the plan and what it will do for our school community and also to honor the community input and vote and voice, both of which were significant pieces in development of the plan. Uh, much has happened since the plan was completed in 2019. In many ways, circumstances have accelerated elements of the plan while other parts have paused. Given that we are at the approximate halfway of the plan, it seemed like the perfect time to do exactly what we do at the beginning of a new calendar year, take stock. We, we are, where are we in terms of achieving the objectives outlined in the plan? Are there shifts or tweaks that should be made? Are there adjacent strategies that we should consider? Where do the new ideas around acceleration fit in? I believe pretty strongly that the plan still has relevance, but these questions are important. Just as the development of the plan was done in full view uh, of and in partnership with the broader community, so should the reflection on the plan. We're working on a plan to host an event to do just that. This will be an opportunity for all who are interested to hear about where we are in the plan and our best thinking in response to the aforementioned questions. Equally important, this will be an opportunity for stakeholder feedback. We are planning for this event to happen in late February. Just before the beginning of the 2022 calendar year, we received uh, very good news from the Massachusetts School Building Authority on the Pickering Project. We successfully completed all of the requirements of the eligibility period ahead of schedule. The MSBA approved our transition to the feasibility study phase. During this phase, we are required to collaborate with the MSBA to document our educational program, generate an initial space summary, document existing conditions, establish the design parameters, develop and evaluate alternatives, and recommend the most cost-effective and educationally appropriate preferred solution to the MSBA. The first step of this in this phase involves designating an owner's project manager. This process will begin formally when the school building committee meets on January 20th, it's kickoff. We are excited to begin taking steps forward in this process. Channeling the philosophy of the previous mayor, the current mayor, and my own personal philosophy, transparency and access will be key features for the broader community in this process. I will keep the committee updated by presenting an update at least once a month. Finally, two years ago, the committee voted to authorize the superintendent 
me, the, author, the authority to evaluate registrations for students over the age of 20. Although this is not a frequent occurrence, it is one that we take seriously. In bestowing that authority to the superintendent, there was also a commitment to update the committee twice yearly. Thus far this school year, we, there have been eight requests by students over the age of 20. Two were permitted to register. The, in these cases, the students were close to completion and we have the appropriate supports to facilitate success. Those who were not, those who were, not were referred to local partner organizations who can better support their needs. That is all I have. Thank you, yeah. Uh, Member Castellanos and Member Magnolia. Dr. Totwiler, thank you so much for your superintendent's report. It's always greatly appreciated to hear that communication and those updates. Always thorough. Uh, I just had some questions. Uh, you, you did briefly, you touched in your, in your superintendent's report. It was, I had a lot of staff reaching out around some of the COVID um, protocol, protocols and some of how, how we've been implementing it. And I'm just going to go over it and feel free to answer uh, accordingly. Just kind of a general stroke of questions. Um, so now that we have implemented the test and stay for students, what is being done for the teachers who have five or more cases test and positive or just cases in classroom generally? We are all close contacts at some point with the children in the class classroom. Why are we not considered for the test and stay as well? State. Testing sites are so booked and purchasing at home tests. And, I, and I, just to kind of go off of what my constituent is, is, is stated is I understand the governor did just reach we just actually will be having more uh, tests and I know that the clinics are running um, but that is a concern right now the uh, COVID you know the, it's, we're seeing an uptick and hopefully um, you know I see the, the mayor is working diligently with the public health director we're all working pretty diligently but um, staff are worried I know families as you mentioned if we heard tonight yeah. um, the virus is definitely it's causing some concerns yeah. so yeah, and, and those concerns I understand completely. I mean, I would never marginalize, um, you know, someone's uh, feelings about uh, where we stand uh, or, you know, to be more frank, uh, someone's fears uh, about the current context. Uh, what I would say, I mean, there's a couple of things that you asked, and I, I'll try to make sure I uh, answer all of them. Uh, first, related to test and stay, staff participation. Uh, state guidelines do not allow for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, in as much as we might want to do that, um, they've made abundantly clear that that is not a program that we can offer staff. Uh, and we run the risk of losing um, the supply that we get uh, to participate in that program for kids. What we do offer staff uh, is each day at 6.30 a.m., any staff who is uh, you know, experiencing uh, mild symptoms can go to Marshall, Classical, or Shoemaker uh, and get a rapid test. Uh, 6.30 a.m., the CIC uh, health staff are there to provide that service for staff. During the day, if a staff, uh, if any member of our staff is experiencing mild symptoms, they can get a test. Uh, but they cannot, if they, are no, if they have no symptoms, then they cannot participate uh, in, 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 you know, uh, in that program. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question, you're going to have to remind me because there were a couple, <laughs> of, a couple in there. <laughs> so, it, just in terms of just a, when, so would you, I, I think you briefly touched it. They can go get tested in the morning, at six thirty. So six thirty. Yeah. And, and also, the, I think this place since uh, probably since September. Yeah. And, and also, when you mentioned the state guideline uh, not allowing. Um, you know, when I when I, I I hate to when I hear that you know, have we advocated you know to say hey you know what's and I see it, it's a state guideline they're gonna say you know this is what it is but it's still it's impacting the morale you know for us I think some of the staff you know the more it's a morale hit and what are we doing to advocate on their yeah. behalf? If so I, I would say there. say two things on that uh, really quickly. Uh, one, we are blessed uh, with incredible nursing staff across our schools Absolutely. and uh, in terms of leadership. Uh, they're on the phone with Desi, our Desi liaison, every single day. That was the other question you Possible asked. Just time. came back to me around closing classrooms. I'm going to come to that in a second. Uh, and so it, we are giving feedback honest and pointed all the time. In my capacity as um, 
the co-chair of the Urban Superintendent Network. I have an opportunity. I have a platform for voicing concerns, and I know I'm not alone as I talk to other superintendents uh, about that challenge. Uh, but it is nothing has changed. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we aren't advocating for it regularly. Uh, with respect to classroom closures, each one of those um, has to be done uh, on a case by case basis. Uh, the nursing staff evaluate the situation uh, and, and make a determination uh, or a recommendation. We have to be on the phone with. Uh, the city's health director, we have to be on the phone with Desi before there's any decision to close a class, but there's a process that's followed for each one of those situations uh, before a final decision is made to do that. In some cases where, you know, someone might say, well, there's this number of positive cases, why isn't that classroom closed? Uh, my, my quick response to that is, there must be other circumstances present that um, make the health officials feel like that is still a safe situation for in-person learning and so we're we believe deeply in the importance of that so we're going to continue with it uh, in other cases they might say you know if maybe there's a inability to mask in that class you know or you know in a pre k class you know the, the the kids don't distance well they might make a decision based on the numbers and it might even be a smaller number uh, to close that classroom so um, there's no manual there's no handbook that says that has an if-then kind of like, if this number of cases, do this. If the, that, that doesn't exist. Case by case, each one is evaluated closely. We're in contact with the appropriate people, and then a decision is made. I just want to say thank you for the communications, too. When, you, when we do, we have these situations arise, you do provide those communications uh, very promptly, too. So I appreciate that. Well, so. We had uh, Member Magnolia and then Member Capola. And Member Fanny, was, was that your as well? I was just going to ask. Okay. Um, so I realize this is the superintendent's report, but this might actually be a question for the mayor and the superintendent jointly, um, which is I know in our previous mayor's administration, when we looked to um, the Pickering project, there was a hope that we could reuse some of the information from the last time Pickering was um, evaluated for a possible replacement. And I just am wondering in your um, report about this, if indeed we can use any of the um, work that we did the last time around, or if uh, the MSBA is requiring us to start over again. Yeah, yeah. So, whoever. <laughs> um, he doesn't know this yet, I don't know if he's watching, but uh, in the uh, school committee look ahead document, there was uh, an agenda item for our meeting on the 27th with one of the people who I think is expert on the topic, and that's Mike Donovan. I was going to ask him to come and sort of shepherd us through uh, what's possible, what's not, what this next phase looks like. So uh, I would prefer to defer to him. That's fine. Prefer to defer. Uh, say <laughs> prefer that two times. Defer. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Member Coppola. Um, how many of the test kits did we pass out to the staff? Mm. Um, I think that total number was around 1,500. Yep. Okay. So yep. um, how far off are we with some still not picking them up or? To take so we offered uh, January 2nd, that Sunday, 8 to noon, for faculty to come. Then we offered a second opportunity uh, after school, the first Monday we were back for staff to come. Our plan um, was to take what was left of those tests mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some principals had already communicated this, give one of those test kits to each elementary student because uh, they are, you know, have the lowest vaccination rates uh, and the uh, rates were positive, rates of COVID were pretty high. So that was our plan, but we don't quite yet have enough uh, to do that. Uh, I was, I got an email from the associate commissioner uh, this afternoon. Uh, apparently the last part of that shipment should be coming to us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So then we'll be prepared to do that next week. But that's what we, our plan was to do that for students. For staff, again, any staff who's experiencing um, symptoms every day of the week mm -hmm. uh, and even over the vacation, they can go to any one of those, uh, those three sites mm -hmm. uh, and get a rapid test. Or if it's during the day, they can get a rapid test on site in school. Mm -hmm. In the, um, the classrooms that we had to close, did those get any um, extra cleaning besides the cleaning that, is, that we're normally doing? Yeah. So do you all want to talk about the, the process that we 
gauge yep. for it. So in terms of a classroom that's closed for COVID, mm -hmm. um, those classrooms are sprayed and also sanitized in terms of going in and wiping down all surface areas, mm -hmm. all high touch areas, and that's done. The principal notifies ISD and that's done that evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pena. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Tutwell for your report. My, uh, one of my questions was already answered from Ms. Magnolia. Um, and the other one was, there's three sites. Want to repeat those again? Uh, Marshall, Shoemaker, and Classical. We try okay. to hit. And that's at 6 a.m.? 6.30. 6.30. And that, that's if they're feeling any symptoms. If you have a fever or something like that, you should stay home. Uh, but if you have mild symptoms, maybe you have a headache, maybe you have sniffles, then you can you can go to one of those sites, and they will the staff at those sites will assess. They'll ask, you know what I mean, what's what brings you here, uh, and if they feel that the person needs to go home, they'll they'll say that. Um, but otherwise, they will get a, a rapid test right then and there. Awesome. Thank you. Great. So I think uh, we would be ready for a motion to request executive session. You want to update them on that basketball game? Oh. We One last piece. Please. Sorry. Know. Yes. Um, that JV game, uh, girls basketball, there were some positive cases that were discovered right before the game, so they canceled it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about no, that. No, no, no. I, right <laughs> I make a motion that um, we go into executive session for two issues. One is to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining relative to Lynn Teachers Union Local 1037, Administrators Association, Nurses and Local 3157A, Clerical Union Local 1736, Monitors, Teamsters Local 42. The discussion of these matters which involve strategy in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on and compromise the bargaining position of the public body. The second request for executive session is in regards to conduct strategy session in preparation for contract negotiations with non-union personnel, i.e. school committee attorney, and to discuss strategy with regards to ongoing litigation. The discussion of these matters, which involves litigation strategy in an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect on and compromise the litigating position of the city of Lynn and the chair so declares. Second. Any seconded? Roll call, please. Member Castellano? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gailey? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. go upstairs. All right. <coughs> yep. <laughs>
Hold on a sec. Thank you, Sheila. He's like, really? Yeah, you can go. Yes. Yeah, I have the book yeah. too. All right, is there a motion to uh, close the executive session and resume the meeting? I make a motion to um, resume exe from executive session into the whole committee session. Second. Second. Roll call. Member Castiano? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Okay, so the last item on the agenda is the ratification of votes, if any, taken in executive session. On the first item, there was a vote taken to uh, authorize Dr. Tutwile to impact bargain with the union stated below. Second. So moved. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Then the next item, uh, there was a vote taken to schedule interviews for the school committee council candidates on Monday, January 24th. Second. Roll call. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Seeing no further business. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Roll call. Mayor Castellano. I'm oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Don't worry about it. No. Hey, one day, maybe. Member Castellano. Yes. Member Yes. Member Dugan. Yes. Member Gately. Yes. Member Magnolia. Yes. Member Pena. Yes. Mayor Nicholson. Yes. Meeting adjourned. Nice. Thank you all for your.